Um, so I'm going to give an introductory lecture to realizability theory. Now, this is a huge topic. Uh, and uh, I would like to make it, keep it informal. So please ask questions as we go along. I'm going to stop and ask, you know, are there any questions? Um, because I'd like to give an introduction that is not too technical, but explains the main ideas. It's a, it really is quite a large topic um, because it covers various corners of computability theory, category theory, and logic. Um, it combines them all. So um, we can just barely scr scratch the surface today. Um, so uh, let's do that. So I imagine the title was going to be, and now this thing is not working. Oh, this pen. OK. Autumn. Realizability. Why is what's the title? Because at this seminar, every once in a while we have a seminar, which is an introduction to sheaves, sheaves, and I think it always happens in the spring, and then then we call it the spring sheaves or sheaves in spring. So this is autumn realizability. I hope maybe there will be another iteration when we have another iteration of students in the classroom. Um, okay, so. Um, we could approach the topic in several ways. We could do it historically by discussing constructive mathematics and the origins of the intuitionistic mathematics and so on. Um, but I think I would like a more naive approach where we directly start from our, our experience as programmers. Okay. So here is something that I think is happens automatically when you program motivation okay when we program some mathematical thing like graphs or trees or numbers or polynomials uh, any kind of mathematical entities what we are really doing is that on one side we have a mathematical entity say a number and on the other side we have its representation in programming code so this is a very open-ended co concept at this moment so this could be just bits if these are just bits in in memory you know then there is some representation of this right so this is the starting point, is that to observe that there is a difference between the mathematical object as an abstract object and its representation in the computer. Uh, this is, I hope, completely and totally obvious. In fact, it's so obvious that we do this that we don't even notice it. When you, when you talk in a, in a class on algorithms, you talk about trees, you're thinking that the trees are the things in your computer. Right. But if we're quite exact, that's not really the case, because if you have a tree here. Then this is a single mathematical object, but there may be many ways of representing this object. For instance, I could just move around in memory the representation of this tree, whatever it is. And that's speaking very strictly, not the same representation because it's in a different location in memory. But also, there might be actual different representations of this object, right? Um, or uh, if you have a set, let's take one that is obvious. If you have a set and you decide that you're going to represent a finite set by a list, well, if you don't say that it needs to be ordered, there will be many ways of representing the same set with these objects. So the object that's sitting, the code that's in your computer, is not exactly the same thing as the entity. And realizability, quite simply, is just this relation. The fact that mathematical objects are represented when we compute by something else, something that is like code or bits in memory or symbols on a tape or terms of a lambda calculus 
or points of a topological space, if you want to get a little weird. These are all possibilities that actually are studied by realizability theory. So the symbol that we're going to use is this. And we put on this symbol, we put the code on this side, and we put the element on this side. So this is some mathematical entity, such as a number, a graph, a function, or um, maybe it's uh, an entire manifold, maybe it's something else. And then this thing here, we'll call this a realizer. And that's, think of it as code, programming code. But it can be really general, okay? So it doesn't have to be code, but think of it that way. So other names for this would be that maybe you would call this witness, depending on the situation, or sometimes it is maybe called um, uh, evidence even. One phrase that I would prefer to avoid is proof. Don't think of this as a proof, okay? That's going to give you the wrong intuition. So if you're coming from type theory, stop, okay? Don't do that. It's not, these are not proofs. So they can, for instance, realizers might be infinite entities. So there are ways of setting up realizability where a realizer is an infinite sequence of bits written on a tape. And this can be quite useful for representing things like real numbers, infinite objects. Right. In fact, if you think about it, actual computers have access to external data. And what is a reasonable mo mathematical model of accessing external data? Well, more or less, it's a stream of bits that's flowing into your computer. And if you think about watching YouTube, you're certainly not going to claim that it's a terminating bit st stream of bits. It seems infinite, right? So it's better to model YouTube as an infinite stream of bits than a finite one. That is a more, uh, that is, it's a more exact approximation of reality. Right? So uh, these things can be quite general. So that's the first point. Um, there are some immediate questions that we can ask here. For instance, well, we already observed that a single entity may have many different representations and that there's nothing wrong with that. That is, that should be fine. Uh, there are good reasons why we want that. But we can ask the uh, the dual question: Should we allow the same piece of code to represent two different entities? Now, that seems a little weird. It's counterintuitive to most programmers to say, for instance, that you're going to have a single line, a single row in your database that represents three people. That sounds kind that sounds like trouble. But we are not going to put this limitation on our setup. We'll discuss it later. But I'm just saying right now, do you have an idea that we're going to represent mathematical entities by things that are like code? And we'll call this the realizability interpretation. So um, let's uh, uh, go up a notch in mathematical abstraction and ask. Okay, what's, you know, how do we make mathematical definitions now, now out of this? This was just an informal idea. So let's make this a little bit formal. So to make this a little bit formal, the first thing I need to do is be a little bit more precise about what code is. I mean, everybody imagines code, but, you know, for all I know, maybe the entire second road thinks that code is Python or something crazy like that. So we need to be a little bit more precise. And also we're going to idealize things. So the next thing, to explain is what's can, what we can use as realizers. Now here again, there are very many possibilities how widely and how generally you may wish to set this up. But I'm going to present the classic one, the one that was, um, I think this was, form, it must have been formulated by Saul Pfefferman, right? PCAs, I think so. The, we, 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 have, we have at least two experts here, right? It was Saul Pfefferman. I yeah, I think, okay, yeah. So it's the notion of a partial combinatory algebra. It's not very, so let me write down, partial combinatory algebra. No, 
Well, yes, you can trace this back, yeah, to Schoenfinkel probably, yeah. The com you mean the combinators and all that. But I think the combinatory completeness of PCAs was, I think, Sol's result. Okay, anyway, how, what is this? So this is a um, this is a, an abstraction, a generalization of um, the um, uh, of the idea of, of a computational model. So uh, there's a thing called a computational model that we want to use here. So that's any kind of mathematical model that is modeling what computation is. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you want to take it, computation is a very open-ended concept. Uh, there, you will hear many times people say, oh, but we have a standard one. It's Turing machines. That's true, but that's not the end of the story. So when people say that all reasonable models of computation are equivalent to the, to the Turing machine model, that is only the case if you look at computing with numbers, with functions going from numbers to numbers. Once you start computing with higher type objects, real numbers, functions and real numbers, functionals like integrals or differential operators, these models are not equivalent anymore. So there are, there are many different worlds of computation depending on what computational model you take. So while it's true that there is a standard, there is a gold standard as far as number theoretic functions are concerned, this is not true for higher order co co uh, computation and this is not well known. So that's why I'm emphasizing it. Okay, so a partial combinatory algebra is uh, one way to formalize what a model of computation is. And it goes as follows. You take a set A, and we'll call this set the set of realizers. Think of this as your code. And then we'll only ask something very simple of the code. We'll ask that there is a partial application operator which is written as dot. We have Agda people. Let's make Agda people happy. We have a partial operation called dot. Um, oh, let's make them unhappy. It's partial, okay? It can be partial, uh, which is called application. And the way you think of it, so I'm going to write like R applied to S, yes? So these are two pieces of code. What you do is you interpret this one as some sort of a procedure or a function or a subroutine or, or something, something like that. And you interpret this one as the input. So this is my procedure that is going to do something. And this is my input to the procedure. And when I run this procedure on this input, it may happen that the result is undefined, for instance, because it never returns. It just keeps computing. Um, but it could also give me a result, in which case I get an element of A. And I'm going to write this without the dot, RS. And I will also write it so that it is left associative. So if I write this, it's the same as that. So this is just the same as in functional programming, where you say, oh, if you want to have an application of some code to two arguments, you first give it the first argument, then you give it the second argument. Uh, for any algebraists in uh, in the audience, this application has no properties that you have ever considered. Okay, it's never associative, it's never commutative. This is not algebra. So, you know. Um, but we have to ask something further. And so there is a minimal requirement that makes things going, which is that we require that there must exist two combinators called K and S that have certain properties. And the properties that they have is, so uh, for all of you who have already, who know the details, please excuse me for skipping some things here. If you can't tell what I'm skipping, you're fine, OK? OK, so the first one is that we have a function, that we have a k that acts like the constant function. You give k an x, 
And after that, it just keeps output outputting X. So if you give it a second argument, it'll just ignore it. So this is a way of dropping arguments. And the other one is S. And what S does, so this one can drop something, and this one can copy something. So what it copies, it's copied, it will copy Z and give it to both X and Y. And the thing that I'm skipping is the fact that these are partial operations. So one side could be undefined and send though the other side can be undefined. Um, so let me not worry about that right now here. Um, so uh, that's all, okay? That's all we need. The way I wrote it, it would be a total combinatorial algebra because I ignored this partiality business. Let me not get into that. Um, there are reasons why this is sufficient uh, because you can use KNS as was already discovered a long time ago. Well, presumably, I don't know if this was already shown Finkel. Probably. If not, it was Curry. Okay, probably. Uh, that KNS are enough to uh, encode all sorts of things. Okay, so KNS is kind of, this is like a minimalist programming language. So people think, oh, you know, you have a, a, a Turing machine, it's a really minimal description. No, no, this is a minimal description because they allow you to encode numbers and pairs and, and uh, lists and trees and just they are actually have the same computational power as Turing machines in terms of calculating with finite data. So, for instance, the identity function is SKK. So you can verify that SKK applied to X is X. Okay, let's do this one. Okay, so what is SKK? So that is K applied to X, K applied to X. So K applied to X just drops the second argument, gives it the first one, so which is X, and so on, so on. So I will not get too deeply into coding with k and s so at some point if i need pairs i'm just going to say oh we can code pairs and then i'm going to write down pairs you can still imagine if you're sitting in the second row just imagine that you're in python okay everybody else has to think in terms of algebras okay so uh what are some examples of pcas let us get a feel for what um uh, what a pca is like so these are supposed to be computational models. So the first one is referred to also as first Kleene algebra. It's only uh, correct that the first example is called the first example, first Kleene algebra. And if I need to, I'll write it as K1. So what is it? What do we take as A? Take as the set of realizers, just the natural numbers. And then we need to explain what is this dot thing. So it's not multiplication of natural numbers. Um, so m dot n is defined as phi m n. What is phi? Phi m is the mth partial computable function. So well, how does this work? This is a function which goes from natural numbers to natural numbers. It's partial, it may not be defined, and it's the one that is computed by the mth Turing machine. What is the mth Turing machine? Well, that's, you pick a reasonable encoding of Turing machines using numbers, and that gives you a coding which to each number there corresponds some Turing machine, and that's the one you want. Um, you can uh, look into a book on computability theory for what a reasonable encoding of Turing machines is, because you could have an unreasonable one. For instance, you take a reasonable encoding and you compose it with a non computable permutation of natural numbers, and very likely you will get something unreasonable. So there are some restrictions on how you code. But that is well understood, and um, that's that's our first example. Now, of course, you need to verify that you have K and S, and that's an exercise in programming with Turing machines, and it leads you to things like the SMN theorem from computability theory. 
And uh, I think probably not the UTM theorem, not here, but very soon afterwards. Um, so this is a classical, this is just going to be some classic computability theory to verify that this is a reasonable model of computation. And it just Turing machines, but they are encoded as numbers. Why are they encoded as numbers? Because logicians like numbers. And uh, ever since Google, they like to encode everything with numbers. And in fact, you call, sometimes you call this M the Google coding of a Turing machine. Uh, here's another one, uh, the untyped lambda calculus. I'm not going to explain what the lambda calculus is. Uh, so if you know what lambda calculus is, then you can listen to this example. So what you do, you take, so there are still options here, but what you do is you take the closed what, how do I want to write this? Closed, closed lambda terms. So no free variables. And you have to quotient them, modulo some equality. And now you have options here. So it could be beta equality. And that's enough. So this is like functional programming, but with drugs because it's untyped. Okay. So because it's untyped, you can then encode all sorts of things. In particular, you can encode general recursion and so on, the fixed point operators. And people had a lot of fun doing this until Haskell came and now we can't do it anymore. So by the way, you could turn Haskell into a model of computation, but then you have to generalize your PCAs to something known as typed PCAs. So where your PCA has types. Uh, where are the K and the S? Well, in this case, they're easy to write down. They're lambda X, lambda Y, X, and lambda X. Well, let me just write it like this. Lambda X, Y, Z, X, Z, Y, Z. Because the lambda calculus literally lets you write down this stuff here. OK. Um, what are some others? I'm not going to get into too many details. As I was already uh, hinting, there is another one that's called Klini second algebra. Where I'm, I can't explain this one. It's a little more complicated. But the point is that I just want to say this is possible. What you do is you take the bare space as your realizers. So infinite sequences of numbers. Think of them as infinite sequences of numbers written on a tape. So this is uh, the notion of computation where you're actually computing with entire streams of information. So you're transforming streams of information to streams of information. And that also gives you an algebra. And all of these give you different models of realizability. All of them are there. These are three different ones. And there are many others. Any questions at this point? Chat? Nope. OK. So if there is a question, uh, just raise your hand or, 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 or speak in the chat. OK, you can do it like this. No, this was not intended. This was also not intended. What the hell happened? There, there we go. You mentioned that points can be realizers. Yes, points of a space can be realizers. This is a space here. This is known as the bear space. This kind of bear, not the kind of bear that Alex knows about. Bear space. So this is a zero dimensional space, but you can also set up realizability models where, say, countably based spaces, countably based T0 spaces would be more reasonable. Are, uh, those are the elements of those are realizers, or if you like domain theory, you can take a model of domain. Uh, you take a domain theoretic model, so a space which uh, contains as a retract its own function space, and then you get a model also which is a topological space. But the re so the realizers are points of the topological space. Uh, I should mention that there are that I wrote up some notes on realizability uh, for last year's. Uh, school the uh, midlands graduate school uh, and uh, i'll 
I'll show them later. Um, so there's lots more written there. So you can, uh, you can, you can read about it there. Okay. So we have now a notion of a model of computation, at least one. Uh, and as I said, keep in mind, this is very flexible. It doesn't have to be this one. There are very many variations, but just to have something concrete in mind, let's use PCAs. And so the next uh, step is to actually define the mathematical structure that captures this idea of realizability that realizers represent elements of sets. Uh, so for that, we uh, are going to define assemblies. Um, I think this is number three, but there is a number three up here, which is a little annoying. So this is like number three, like that. Assemblies. Um, once again, there are different ways of setting up the mathematical structure. As I have now said several times, this is a, 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 a big topic, but I'm going to start with the one which I think is easy to explain however it is also at the same time um sufficiently unusual to jolt your mind to, to 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 sort of take you out of the naive expectations of a programmer so there are a couple of points with assemblies that will look a little bit weird to a programmer and that is uh, that, that that's one of the reasons i want to speak about assemblies okay so what is an assembly? So first of all, we fix a model of computation. So we fix a partial combinatory algebra A. And now we work just with this A. Okay, uh, And we define an assembly to be a set. So this, a set of mathematical entities to be realized together with this relation, so where this is a relation, and what does it relate? So it has to relate, I'll, I'll write it like this, I know it's a little strange, it relates realizers to elements of X. So if we write R, X, little x, we say R, realizes x and quite importantly notice that now i have a subscript here so when i started with my original idea i didn't have a subscript but as it turns out you can't just really reasonably encode entities in complete isolation from everything else you really need to know that the entity you are encoding is a member of some type or set or space it's the entire set or the entire space that receives an encoding. For instance, I might have an encoding of graphs, OK? And then I show you a graph, I don't know, maybe this one here. Let me see if I can manage. Here's a graph, OK? And you could notice it's a cubic graph, OK? So you might have two representations, one for general graphs and a special one for cubic graphs. And then it's going to matter whether you think that this is an element of cubic graphs or general graphs, and you will use one or the other representation. That's why we really can't have a global realizability relation. I, I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm just saying we're not gonna do it because that's not what happens. It's also not what happens in practice. OK, so um, re so here, x, r realizes x. And if needed, we say as an element of x, as an element of the assembly x, we need to sometimes read this subscript because it matters. So that's an assembly. But now let's think, do we want any extra conditions here? Uh, the way I wrote this, the relation is completely arbitrary so in particular it might be empty which means i don't have any realizers now that's going a little too far right to say i mean if you let the programmers do that that's they're going to have they're going to get their salaries for free because you will call you and say like implement the health system and then they say i'm done empty set right 
that's not very useful. So you want them to work a little bit. So the, ver the very least what we want, we want to say that every element has a realizer. So for every, for every x in our uh, carrier set, there must exist at least one realizer such that x is realized by it. Yeah, that's uh, that says that it's kind of the converse of totality. The way I wrote things, that the relation is total, but the other way around. Um, there is one other condition that we might require which i we i already mentioned which is known as modesty and that would be the one that says that you if so the one that says well for all realizer for all elements if r realizes both x and y then they must be equal that is to say you prohibit to different elements from sharing a realizer. As soon as they share a realizer, they are uh, must be the same. This is something that I think a programmer would naturally just assume. They wouldn't even think about doing violating this condition because, as I said, it's a very it's it's not intuitive that you would want to allow this. However, we will allow it. So this is an extra condition that we are not going to assume. And when this is true. We call an assembly a modest assembly. So it's an extra condition that we in general do not require. It is a reasonable condition, which gives a similar kind of structure, but it is a little more limited. And so there are a couple of things you can't do with modest assemblies that you can do with general assemblies. So I'm just saying that, so therefore we should not assume it. Uh, we're going to look at examples of assemblies, and you will see that most of them tend to be modest, the ones that we are going to use. OK, uh, of course, we're not going to end here, right? We want a category, right? There is a, a possibly a amazing, I mean, there is a, a large amount of category theory that you can throw at this uh, subject. But let's just at least have a category first. So we want morphisms. What would be an assembly morphism, or I'm just going to call it an assembly map? F from X to Y. So X and Y are now assemblies. Uh, well, OK. So we would expect it to be a map F from X to Y. So something that maps. The under, it's a map between the underlying sets, but with an extra condition. Because if it's a, just an arbitrary set theoretic map, it's completely ignoring the extra structure. So we need some condition. So what is the condition? The condition is, again, the one that you would naturally and automatically expect from a programmer, which is you should be able to implement the function. If you can't implement the function, then something's wrong. So what would it mean for a function to be implemented? in the code. Well, there needs to be a realizer which does to realizers what f does to elements. So let's write that down, which is which is so the map needs to be realized, which means what? It means that there is some realizer r such that the following holds, and I'm not going to write down all the quantifiers because I'm on a whiteboard, I'm allowed to cheat like that. So I want to say, if you have that S realizes little x, then if I apply R to S, I'm going to get a realizer in Y for what? Well, for F of x. Yes? And because of, because application is partial, I should really say, uh, by the way, this is going to be defined. R of S cannot, is not allowed to be undefined. Um, again, I'm not going to worry too much about this defined, undefined business. Just keep in mind that if you are careful, you need to keep saying that things are defined when they're, when they're supposed to be defined and so on. Uh, 
Um, uh, this is maybe important for people who have done too much type theory because in type theory, things are defined. So here, things may not be defined. We're really embracing partiality. Partiality is, uh, there are theorems that say that partiality is an essential component of computation. It is not avoidable. And I'm saying this not only because I want to uh, provoke type theories, but also because it's true. OK. Uh, we get a category this way, which we're going to write as ASM. In the 90s, people wrote this category as ASS, as witnessed by several PhD theses. But you know, political correctness took over in the 2000s. OK, so this is the category of assemblies and assembly maps. It is a fairly nice category to work with. It has a lot of structure. It is not a topos, and I'll discuss this um, at the very end. Um, there is a subcategory uh, of modest assemblies. If you add this additional condition, then you will get a subcategory called the subcategory, which is also sometimes called modest sets as, a, as opposed to modest assemblies, because after all, they are sets equipped with some realizability relations. So both names. I think modest sets is the original terminology. I'm calling them modest assemblies to emphasize that this is just assemblies with an additional condition. We could now spend a month studying the categorical structure of uh, this category, but we're not going to do that. Let's just look at some basic constructions in this category to get a feel for how things work. Uh, this is not number three. This is probably something else. I lost count, so I'll just say constructions. So if you meet a new category in the street, you know, what should you ask? Well, you should ask things like, does it have products? Does it have co-products? Is it Cartesian closed? Um, is it a topos? Does it have limits? Does it have co-limits? Are there interesting functors from this category to some other category and so on? So we can't do everything, but to familiarize ourselves, let's look at products, exponentials, just a couple of them. OK, so first, let's try products. So there are products, and I mean just binary products here. So if I have two assemblies, x and y, then I can form a new assembly, x cross y. And if you follow your programming intuition, you will do the correct thing. You can later verify that the, the, the thing you define has the desired categorical properties. So how would you define the Cartesian product of two assemblies? Well, presumably, you would say, take the Cartesian product of the underlying sets. But how about the realizability relation? So now you have to also explain what does it mean for a realizer to represent an ordered pair? So what does it mean for some piece of code to represent an ordered pair x, y, where x is from x and y is from y? Well, I think people would say, well, R has to be a, R itself has to be an ordered pair. There has to be some encoding of ordered pairs in your partial combinatorial algebra. And indeed, there is one. And then that encoding has first and second projection and so on. So for instance, what you could write is you could say, if I take the first projection of R, I'm going to get a realizer for X. and if I take the second projection for R, I'm going to get a realize of OR, I'll get a realizer for Y. So this is now saying more or less. So R maybe is not, strictly speaking, in the encoding of a pair, but at least behaves like one. So if you apply the first projection, you'll get the first realizer and the second one, the second realizer. So this would be a good definition. You could also just require that R must be the encoding of a pair. It would also be OK. That's a minor technical difference. Um, so this will, in fact, give you products. And I think there, there's, no, there's no surprise here. 
Okay, how about exponentials? So um, if you're a functional programmer, you want your exponentials. You want to have the assembly of maps. So you would write it maybe like this. Okay, or you might write it as x arrow y. Both. I will use both, which, which, whichever seems prettier to me at the moment. I'll use one or the other. So what would that be? So now you would say, well, these are functions from x to y. Okay, okay, but remember, they need to have realizers. So it's not a good idea to take all functions. We should take just the realizable ones, so, so the ones that have realizers. So in this case, we first define what the realizer is. So a realizer for a function f, so if f is a function from x to y, from the underlying sets, we say that it realizes it if, well, we already wrote the condition up here. It's this condition here. When is f realized? So you say a realizer for f is an implementation of f. So for all x and r, if r realizes x, then nope that's it you can't have r twice s if s realizes x then r applied to s realizes f of x and now here you take those f's which are functions from y to x to y so these are set theoretic functions such that there is some realizer So while you don't take you don't take all functions, just the realized ones. So this means that in this category, for instance, if you look at uh, functions from natural numbers to natural numbers, of course we haven't said yet how the natural numbers form an assembly. But if you do, then you will get uh, the the assembly n to the n will contain only those functions that can be realized. Well, which ones are they? Well, that depends on your underlying model of computation. If your underlying model of computation is Turing machines, Kleene's first algebra, they will be the computable functions, the Turing computable functions. If your model is lambda calculus, they will be the functions which can be realized in the lambda calculus, which happens to be just the Turing computable functions. But if you take Kleene's second algebra, then it's going to be all functions because in the Kleene second algebra, a realizer is an infinite stream of integers, which is precisely what a function is from natural numbers to natural numbers. So you'll be, you'll be able to represent all of them. Uh, let's do sum as well, because maybe the sum is a little bit educational. How would you do the disjoint sum of two, of two sets? Of, sorry, of two assemblies. So I would take the disjoint sum of the underlying sets. But again, what about the realizability relation? What should we take here? And let me write down the one that's wrong. You might say R realizes some element U in here. If R realizes it as an element of X or it realizes it as an element of Y. This isn't the right thing to do. This would be some sort of failed attempt at doing the union, first of all, because the elements of the this disjoint sum, what are they? Aha, maybe we should write this down. What are the elements here? We need some way of writing down the disjoint elements. So I'm just going to write them as uh, either their iota 1 of x or iota 2 of y. So I want to tag them. And uh, if there are very non-computational people in the audience, just do some encoding of this joint sum. Okay. Uh, so anyhow, this is not a good one. Here we come to uh, actually an important point. You should indicate your realizer should carry information as to whether the element came from the left or the right. 
You shouldn't forget that. It is amazing how difficult this is to get right in programming languages. For instance, C has unions, which I suppose if you are a true hacker can be used to your benefit, but they are not disjoint sums. So this information, there needs to be a bit of information indicating whether you come from the left or the right. So it would actually be more, something more like this. You encode a pair and you here encode uh, like the numeral zero and an R, and this will realize iota one of X if R realizes X. And then for the other ones, you are going to encode. So I'm now going doing the kind of encoding that you might have you might use here as well. And you would say the other kind of realizer is one comma R, and then this R has to realize something in Y. Okay. So you explicitly mark whether you're from the left or the right component. Uh, let's see, time. Let me do one little thing and then uh, we can have a short break. So, as I said, one of the things that you want to, oh, by the way, so what this is showing almost, we still need the terminal object, uh, is that we have a Cartesian closed category by Cartesian closed category. In fact, it's more, it's locally Cartesian closed. It's a model of type, type theory and so on. So, it's a, it's a fairly nice category. Um, so, one thing that you should always ask is when you have a new category, does it have any nice functors to other categories? And the first such uh, category to consider is sets. So can you think of a functor from assemblies to sets? And whatever you think of, I'm going to call it gamma. OK, well, yes. Uh, you could uh, you could do it like this. You have here an assembly, and you can just forget the relation, right? The forgetful functor. I'm using gamma because it's also the global points functor. So that's gamma. Just forget it. Okay. How about the other way around? Suppose you have a set, an arbitrary set. Can you think of some computability structure on it? Is it possible to give a computability structure to any set whatsoever? For instance, Aleph 77. How would you implement Aleph 77? Uh, uh, that seems a bit tricky, right? But we are now going to abuse the fact that we allow elements to share realizers. So the extreme form of elements sharing realizers is that they all share all realizers. So in this direction, we call this NABLA, is NABLA S. So what is NABLA S? NABLA S has the same set S. And then you write down the most ridiculous realizability relation you can think of, which is R realizes an element X always. So literally every realizer realizes every element. This is an entirely un uninformative way of implementing things. So you see, when you write down your job contract for the programmer, you should insist that things not ought to be modest, right? Because this is not modest. There's lots of sharing going on. So if you do this, the programmer's job gets too easy. They just every time you they want you, you say please write some code, they just get say 42, right? It works. Um, nevertheless, this is a nice functor mathematically speaking. It embeds sets into assemblies, and there are deeper connections. And in fact, what we get is an adjunction, which I hope I'm going to get done the right way, the right way, which I think that NABLA is ought to be the right adjoint to gamma here. Um, the way to imagine this, I can liken this to topology. So in topology, 
you have the underlying set of a topological space, the forgetful functor. Are there any functors going back? Yes. You can turn a set into a topological space in two ways. What are the two nice ways of turning a, a, a set into a topological space? The discrete topology and the indiscrete topology, the smallest one. Yes. This nabla is the right adjoint. So exercise. We have the functor that we have the discrete topology functor. We have the indiscrete topology functor. One of them is the left adjoint and the other one is the right adjoint to the forgetful one. Well, the right adjoint one is the one that's like Nabla. And OK, I'll give you two guesses. Which one is it? It's the indiscrete one, right? So the indiscrete, so Nabla puts computability structure on assemblies in a trivial way, in the same sense, the same way that the indiscrete topology puts a topology on a set. So that's a good way to think about it. Um, yeah, this would actually be a nice uh, point to have a short break. So let's have a short break for, um, is five minutes enough? 10 minutes, five minutes? Hmm? Five. OK, let's do five. So we'll come back at, what's the time now? Uh, now, nah, that's not a round number. Let's come back in the 11.25. Okay, so nine minutes. Get up, walk, get a coffee, open window. Oh, windows are open. Okay. Yes, so uh, it is traditional to have questions during the break. Go ahead. Uh, are the stop screens modeling the size? We said that the subscript in the realizability relation gives us a sort of context. Uh, sorry, what was the question? If the subscript on the realizability relation models a, models a, a type. A type. No, the entire structure models a type. The, the yeah. entire assembly is a model, is the semantic meaning of a type. So there is a way to interpret type theory in which types are assemblies. Can this idea of context be somehow included into a category? By context, now you mean what? A type theoretic context? By choosing X, we mean typical graphs. Like well, I think. Graphs and typical graphs. I mean, you would have two different assemblies, right? You'd have one assembly, which is the assembly of graphs, and you'd have another assembly, which is the assembly of cubical graphs. And I think this is just, I mean, this is the situation is going to be a bit like, oh, there is more than one interesting topology on the real numbers. So we can have the real numbers with the Euclidean topology or with the discrete topology or with the upper topology and so on. So. It's 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 not any different than uh, other examples in mathematics where you have a set enriched with a structure. It's just that our structure uh, endows the set with a notion of computability. So I'm not really sure what you're asking. Because so basically, if we have a, a, a more elementary characterization of this. Yeah, we're going to come down to what What do you mean like, by context? If, if you want to talk about graphs, uh, yeah. about cubical graphs instead of graphs, then you need to consider an assembly or just... An assembly, of course. Assembly. These are two different assemblies. You always take an yeah. assembly as a whole. The subscript is just a notation of convenience. Yes, so maybe that's the best answer. Yeah, that's just a notational convenience. I could, I, I could call this whatever I wanted. Okay. Yeah. So I could say, uh, you know, um, what would be a silly example in the uh, first Klinian algebra. Okay. I could have the following assembly. I take the assembly of natural numbers, and my relation is divisibility. Right. There's no subscript anywhere. It's not even written uh, this, in this in this form. Right. 
Yeah. Does that? I think that answers the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna have a short pause in recording. Oh, another question. Let's record the questions. Yes. So you mentioned that. Uh, the, the assembly of functions from the natural numbers to the natural numbers and the second, with the second thing you have to grasp the, the full set theoretic one, one, yes? Yeah, yeah. 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 all in what sense? In whatever sense you are in. All, all functions. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but are these now okay I, i'm gonna i'm gonna counter with a i'm going to counter with a uh, uh i have a counter question did you ever in your analysis class ask your professor in what sense do you mean all reals you didn't why didn't you ask that question because you're asking now in what sense do you mean all functions why is that a fair question here but it's not in your analysis class what's the difference because there's more uh, axiom uh, because because this seminar is called the seminar on foundations of mathematics so that would be that's that that's a fair point right yes okay yes okay so, um, no, it depends on it depends on your meta theory, right? Your meta theory informs you of what are the possible sequences of numbers. So, uh, in fact, this is uh, this leads to an interesting question, which is if I uh define these assemblies in different kinds of meta theories say intuitionistically or classically or yeah does it make a difference and yes it makes a difference yeah. but then, so how does it then sort of make precise that they're all the, just is the assembly a isomorphic to the sort of function uh, uh in what sense are they all uh they will be all when you have the assembly of natural numbers. So let's assume we figured out what the assembly of natural numbers is. So if you calculate nabla, uh, sorry, gamma of the assembly of natural numbers to the assembly of natural numbers, yes, that's the underlying set. Well, that underlying set, so this is the set of realized functions. In general, it's a subset of all functions from natural numbers to natural numbers and in the case of second cline algebra here you will have an equality that means that's what it means all of them all of them with respect to your category of sets is a, maybe a good answer but also this equality holds sort of uh, independently from the meta theory this is the meta theory um Right? Because what am I doing? I'm saying I have a category of assemblies, I have a category of sets, I have gamma, and I'm claiming some equation holds here. Yeah. No, but I mean, in this category of sets, has the log x to the middle in it. Yes. If it has the, yes. So if the category, sorry, I'll be repeating a little bit because I'm not sure that uh, it's getting recording. So if the category of sets has, uh, uh, if if it has excluded middle, okay. So if it's classical sets, yes. Then, um, I mean, whether or not we have it, the, the type of functions from end to end will be different. But this equality. Calls... Oh, it's a lot worse than that, right? Even within the classical set theories, you can play games on what n to the n looks like because of forcing. And, no, what huh? I'm asking is uh, whether this equality then holds irrespective of sort of what category of sets. Yeah, so the one way to say this is you start with some category of sets and then inside the set you have a PCA and then that will give rise to the category of assemblies and this functor gamma. If your uh, PCA is the second Clini algebra as defined in this category set of sets, you will always have this equation. So an equa the equation doesn't really depend on what functions are there really? Yeah, yeah. 
So depending on what uh, axioms you have in the category of life, you will also get a different second string algebra. Well, they are all sick they are all second clini algebra but each one lives in its own category of sets yeah. so now you have to find a way of comparing them yeah, yeah. so even more meta theoretically we can think of their i'm just pointing out that it's maybe a little bit careless to ask are they the same because they live in different categories so that's not an ob it's not obvious that that's how to answer that. Yeah. Are there any questions in the chat? We should just have like breaks, like you should have 10 minutes of talk and then five minute break where I tell everybody go away because that's when people ask questions. And something really bad is going on with our sewer system, right? What are they doing? So luckily, Zoom is not recording the awful smell that's coming into this classroom. Well, it's not a new smell. No, it's not a new smell. It's been around for like a week, right? No, it's been around for a couple of years. Couple of years. Maybe it, does, does, it just doesn't reach the fourth floor. <laughs> Hmm? It's getting close, yeah. Are we back? Uh, what's the time? It's 26, yeah, we're back. Okay. Uh, let's see. I would like to explain the following things. I would like to ask, what is the assembly of natural numbers? I would like to give you, I would like to ask, what are some different structures a same realizability relations that one can put on a two element set and then speak about logic. So let's go through the natural numbers and the two element assemblies. Um, so the natural numbers, uh, I never stopped the recording, right? I can just keep going. Okay. So natural numbers. What should be the assembly of natural numbers? Well, here is an idea. I'm one of those efficient programmers, NABLA N. Right? Now, this sounds wrong because this means that any number can be realized by any piece of code. But why is it wrong? Prove me it's wrong. Why not? I mean, after all, I can I can implement uh, addition, 42. I can implement multiplication, 42. If you give you just the assembly, you're not sure which number it realizes. But what is wrong with that? You so yes, I you I will give you a realizer. You have no idea what number it is. Give me give me give me a mathematical reason, not just a bad feeling or feeling of guilt or threatened to. Uh, um, fire me right for being a weird programmer we need a mathematical reason well we could use category theory does category theory have to say anything about natural numbers it should be the natural numbers object it should be the natural numbers object that is the answer right so you can there is a notion of the natural numbers object in a category which is the object in a category that plays the role of natural numbers but what is it well there are several ways to say it but one of them is it's a certain initial algebra for the functor x goes to one plus x and then there is levier's characterization there's more than one way of saying what it is and the answer is this one is bad because it's not the natural numbers object so bad because it's not the natural numbers object. So you need a better one. This trick works often, but not always. So I used to think that it works always, but then Alex taught me that it only works sometimes. I'll explain it over lunch. So we are in search of 
a computability structure on a certain set, namely the natural numbers. And we would like to, uh, we, we don't know which one is the correct one. There might be many different candidates. Uh, to give you an idea of how you can have different candidates, if I ask the same question about the real numbers, it is far less obvious what to do. Because you might say, oh, a real number is represented by a binary sequence of, by, by infinite binary sequence of uh, zeros and ones. Or maybe you want the decimals. Um, uh, or maybe you want something else. You want the golden cut ratio or something, right? Maybe you want continued fractions. Lots of different possibilities how you could represent real numbers. How do you know which one is correct? So this is a baby example of that. And the answer is, we know we have a criterion. We know what we want because we have a universal characterization of the thing we're looking for. We actually had that even earlier when we defined the products. Why are these the correct products other than that they look correct? They are correct because they are the category, the category theoretic products in this category. So the same goes for natural numbers. This, this is not a natural numbers object. Something else is. And whenever you can use that, that is very valuable that you can do that. You can't always do it, but often you can do it. And then sometimes it gets tricky because if I ask you, what is the assembly of bounded linear operators on a separable Hilbert space? Does it have a universal property? If it has many, will they all like how are you gonna do this? It's not so obvious anymore. Okay. But at least in the simple cases, we can rely on there being a nice category theoretic universal characterization. So the one that is going to work, so this one is not the right one, is you take, well, you take the natural numbers, and then this realizability here is that a realizer, so the way you want to do this is you cheat, okay? You say n realizes n. Well, okay, what is this? This is number, this is a number as a mathematical entity. And this is the number encoded inside your PCA. And how you encode, how do you encode numbers in the PCA? So this is called then a numeral. One way that works is using Curry numerals. Okay. What are Curry numerals? You can look it up in the, uh, in the notes that I'm, I will point you to. I will not forget, but it's some encoding using K's and S's that does the right thing so that you get the natural numbers object. And uh, if you used any other encoding of numbers, you still would know whether you did it correctly or not. You just ask, did I get the natural numbers object? Is it the initial algebra for the functor x goes to 1 plus x? If it is, you're guaranteed that whatever you did is isomorphic to the one that we already know that works. OK, so the next thing I'd like to ask is uh, assemblies on an L so there aren't a lot of assemblies on a one element set. If you have a set with a single element, then at least in this setup, it doesn't matter how you realize it so long as you realize it. But how about two element sets? So two element assemblies. Of course, by now you've already learned the trick, right? Nabla two. Okay, so let's say two is the set which contains zero and one. To make set theorists happy. Okay, two. Nabla two is definitely a two element assembly. It just has a trivial realizability uh, relation. Another one would be, I'm going to write it like this, B for Boolean algebra. That would be the one where um, I say, well, it's the set 0, 1. And this relation here is, again, like the one up here. So I would say the numeral 0 realizes 0, and the numeral 1 realizes 1. 
What's the difference? Well, the difference is that if I get a realizer of an element in B, I can actually tell which one it is, as opposed to NABLA2. So for instance, I can make I can make certain choices. I can do an if then else. Okay. Uh, so these are a little bit like two extremes. Um, but notice that they are both Boolean algebras. For both of them, I can implement AND and OR. You can implement AND and OR here because 42. Okay. Soon, as soon as you're implementing any map, so what is AND? AND is a map that goes from NABLA2 to, to NABLA2 to, to NABLA2. As soon as you need to implement anything that goes into NABLA something, you just say whatever, because everything will work. You also don't get any information, but it doesn't matter because whatever. Okay. Um, here, you actually have to do a little if then else if you want to do it. But you can do it. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, yes, I'm getting there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. Okay. So is there some other way to get at this B? Why is this B here? Did I just make it up? Well, yes, as Alex is pointing out. It's the coproduct of one and one, where one is the one point assembly. So this is the coproduct. So that's why it's important. Exercise. I can think of, so these two have the same underlying set, zero and one, zero and one. So I can have the identity function. Yes? I can have the identity function in either direction. In which direction is it realized? From B to NABLA2 or from NABLA2 to B? Which one is easier to realize? Always easier to realize if you go into NABLA2. So the identity function is realized as a map from B to NABLA2. And in fact, it's a monomorphism. So B is a subassembly of NABLA2, but they are not isomorphic because you can't go back. Is this weird? It's only weird if you're fixated on set theory. But if you think a little bit like a topological spaces, it's perfectly OK. In topological spaces, this would be like saying, oh, I can have a discrete topology on a space, and then some other topology on a space, and then the identity function will be continuous. Right? But not, it's not going to be continuous if I go the other way around. So it's a similar situation. There are other interesting two element assemblies, but we're not going to get, get into them for the, uh, um, because we don't have time. Um, but in between, there are many other, there, there are still others where you break the symmetry between zero and one. Um, so, okay, I'm just going to say what another one is. Another one would be the following. You would implement one with codes of Turing machines that halt and zero with codes of Turing machines that don't halt. And because there is an asymmetry between halting and non-halting, zero and one are now not symmetric anymore. You can't switch them around. So you would get something. And this something would be sitting between B and NABLA2. And you can write a PhD thesis about this. And Pino Rossellini did. And he put many more interesting things in the thesis apart from that definition. OK. Let's get to the last part. So far, I was just talking about objects and morphisms. But what is really missing here is logic. Um, and that is an essential part of realizability. And in fact, realizability was uh, it was invented by Kalini to capture a certain kind of logic, namely intuitionistic logic. So um, it started with logic. We're not starting with logic. Now, why would you want the logic? You would want the logic because, so one reason you would want the logic is because if I now ask you, how are we going to implement the real numbers? You might weasel out by saying, oh, this needs to be a certain object with a certain um, universal property, but it's going to be difficult to, to, to describe what universal property you mean without ha getting your hands on the ability to say things using logical formulas in a meaningful way for realizability. 
So let's think about that. So the last part is realizability logic or the realizability interpretation of logic. I'm just going to write realizability logic. In a sense, there is a one liner that I can say here, and then we're done. We say use the sub objects vibration or something. So use the sub objects. Okay. So the internal logic, use the internal logic of sub objects. What am I trying to say? Whenever you have any category C, and then you have say some object a you can look at its sub objects for instance in uh, sets that's going to be subsets in groups that's going to be subgroups in topological spaces that's not going to be subspaces it's going to be continuous injections right so you look at the sub objects and the sub objects of a form a partial order if that partial order is nice you could use it to interpret logic well how nice should it be if you want to interpret uh, conjunction then that suborder needs to have infima if you want to interpret disjunction it needs to have suprema if you want to interpret heighting uh, intuitionistic propositional calculus it needs to be a heighting algebra if you want to interpret classical logic, it must be a Boolean algebra and so on. So in a sense, there is nothing that we should be inventing here. We already have a category. It already has subobjects. And those subobjects are telling us what the logic is. It's the logic of the subobjects, whatever that is. It could be a pretty bad one. If you look at groups, for instance, and then you look at the subgroups, and is that a nice logic? Eh, kind of, not really. I mean, mostly it gives you conjunction and existential quantifier. So, you know, something. But here, we're going to get lots of logic. Here, we're going to get full first order intuitionistic logic. Uh, so that's nice. So in a way, now we could spend like a week figuring out what this is. So you would have to say, oh, OK, take an assembly. Study what does it mean that you have a monomorphism into this assembly? When are two of these monomorphisms um, isomorphic? Because if they're isomorphic, they represent the same subobject. And then figure this out, calculate it. This is the business of categorical logic. And you could do that, and it's been done. Um, and it's how I learned categorical logic, right? <laughs> in fact, by calculating all these things. But I can give you that once you do all of this, it's very likely that you can come up with some other equivalent way that doesn't work of, of expressing your logic that doesn't work directly with subobjects, which are equivalence classes of monos, and that's kind of annoying. But you might have some other better way of explaining what the logic is. And in the case of realizability, this happens, uh, and you can we can write it down. Okay, so I'm going to write it down. But uh, keep in mind what we're trying to shoot for. Given a given an object, we would like to have something that plays the roles of predicates on A. Because if we have something that plays the role of predicates on A, then that means we're going to have predicate calculus, which is what we want. So I will tell you that what I'm going to say now is actually just the subobjects, but it's in disguise, it's equivalent. A realizability predicate on an assembly X is a map phi. So let me do this visually correctly. Ah, this is going to be OK. That takes elements of X to sets of realizers. And I'd like to contrast this with an example that you're familiar with, 
The example you're familiar, were, familiar with is set theory, a set theoretic predicate on a set on a set S is a map phi from the set to 0, 1. Or I can just say 2. Right? So what's going on is I am changing this 2 to the power set of A. So what is going on? Well, if you now look at the totality of all these predicates, what do you get? You get 2 to the S. Well, 2 to the S is just the same thing as the power set of S. And this one, if you order it with the subset relation, you're going to get a complete Boolean algebra. That is super nice. That's super nice because that means we're going to have lots of logic, classical logic. So we want to have the same trick here, which is to say, OK, if that's our realizers, that's only part of it. What will play the role of subset? OK, you want that as well. So we need here some sort of order. When is one? When does one predicate entail another one? This is the entailment relation, uh, just like here we use the subset relation. Okay, so well, let's define this one. We'll say phi until psi if, and now we have to start thinking again like programmers. This is not going to be like a subset. This has to be computational in nature, so it has to be some. Something where a, a piece of code tells you how phi intel psi. And to, re, to, 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 to understand what is going on, think of it this way. Here, f of x is either 0 or 1, right? Here Sorry. it's 0 or 1, yes? The, the chat box is covering. The chat box is jumping up and down. I have a team. No, it's, it's covering the. Oh, I see. Oh, the ones, the things you see on the screen. Yes, How about this. Better? No? No, still covering. Here. They're not asking any questions anyway. Okay, so here, 5x is just, it's true or it's false. But here it's more informative. Here it's an entire set of realizers. Think of this set of realizers as the reasons for phi of x being valid. Just like mathematical entities must be represented in the computer with a piece of code, so do logical facts. Logical facts are not going to be just true or just false, but must be represented in the computer. Now, you might be thinking, but that's obvious. Zero represents false, one represents true, end of story. Well, that is only one very specific way of witnessing a fact. And it is also a very crude one because I say zero, you have no idea what the uh, logical fact was that is false, right? It's not very informative. So there will be other ways, and we'll see what these other ways are. So let me give you an example. Uh, suppose I uh, suppose there is a function uh, from natural numbers to natural numbers, and I claim that it outputs a prime number. Okay. So I tell you it outputs a prime number. I want to say it's true. If I just say one, I say okay. He claims it outputs a prime number. But there is a more informative way of establishing the fact. I can say it outputs a prime number if you feed it the number 117. Now you have something to work with because you go, you apply your function to 117, you see whether you got a prime number. Right? It's more informative than just saying, yeah, 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 it does. Because if I don't tell you this 117, you have to go and find it by yourself. And that's more work. So this is a relevant difference from a computational point of view. Because, again, if it weren't, then when the programmer is asked to implement the accounting software for a company, 
they just say one. And I was like, what are you doing? They say, it's computable. You do it. You know, you can just, you don't actually need the program. It's computable. You can just find it yourself. I could find my own prime number. You can just do your own counting. Why would I need to do anything? So, you know, it goes in that direction. So logical facts need to be witnessed in a more informative way. So now that we have this idea, how do we say that phi implies psi? Well, there has to be a realizer which does what? Which converts evidence of phi to evidence of psi. Okay? So for all x, for all s, uh, so this time I think I can write it nicely. For all x in x, if s is evidence that phi of x holds, then if I apply r to s, I'm going to get evidence that psi of x holds. That's, that's basic, that's our basic logic works this way. So now it's not anymore about things being x just true or false and just happens to be a subset, but you need to give evidence, computational evidence that tells you how to convert evidence of phi to evidence of psi. And notation, there's one other piece of notation. Write S, that's not an S, S realizes phi of X instead of S is an element of phi of X. And this way we get, so this sets up the logic. And at this point you can say, oh, okay, you define the relation on this set of predicates. So this is now a relation and I get a structure. I get the par set of A to the X ordered. How good is this? It's, is it a partial order? Is this, is this reflexive? Is this transitive? Yes, yes. Is it a heighting algebra? Yes. So that means we're going to have a shunistic logic. Uh, does it support quantifiers? Ah, that is a more complicated question because it involves several assemblies when you speak about quantifiers. But the answer is yes. So you get an interpretation. And now maybe is a good moment for me to try to get Say again. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, thank you very much. So it is, uh, it's, it's reflexive, it's uh, uh, transitive, but it's not anti-symmetric. So it's a, it's a pre-order. From a categorical point of view, there is nothing wrong with working with pre-orders. When you do categorical logic, pre-orders are just as good as partial orders. So you might as well just work with this pre-order. But if you really feel the need to work with the partial order, you can quotient by equivalence and you will get a partial order. I don't have a strong opinion on this. I think pre-orders are better in this, in this, uh, in this, I don't know. I don't know why I would work with equivalence classes. It just seems unnecessary. And I think there is a page 89. So here are some notes on realizability that I wrote up. And then I would like to show you what this logic comes to. Summary of realizability logic. This is, uh, this is the thing that we want to look at. Uh, uh, this shouldn't be too difficult to find. You say notes on realizability. I don't know if you have to type my name, probably. Nah, not really. Okay. So the logic comes down to this. And this is also the kind of thing that Kleene wrote down originally when he was giving an interpretation of logic 
he was doing it just for arithmetic. So he didn't have all this assembly stuff. That's all fairly new. That's 1980s probably. Um, and he just had natural numbers and, and, and first order logic. So um, it's here. We don't have to look at all of it. But let's just uh, notice some similarities. So how do you give evidence of conjunction? You give evidence of conjunction by giving so by giving evidence of the first conjunct and the second conjunct separately, and of course this is a typo and it should be S and D. Okay, how do you give evidence of a disjunction? Again, you give evidence of either one together with the information as to whether you're in whether you are in which one you you are uh, realizing. So R has to be either of the form left of U, where U is a realizer for p of x or right of v where v is a realizer for q of x once again so this is now starting to look a lot like uh curry howard isomorphism where logical facts are witnessed by programs which they are here there's a difference though uh that um our pcas can be a little weirder than type theory. In type theory, everything is defined and it's total and so on. These PCAs can, first of all, they can be partial operations, such as running Turing machines that never terminate. So some there's some partiality involved, but also they don't have to be finite objects. They can be things like uh, infinite streams of natural numbers. So it's I don't think it's correct to write, to call them proofs. It's better to call them evidence or witness or realizer. So you get this logic, and now once you have the logic, this logic is rich enough so that you can write down, for instance, the construction of real numbers. And when you do, you can just calculate what you got. You literally bec it becomes an exercise in calculation. To write down the uh, constructively reasonable definition of reals and then you calculate what assembly that is and you're going to get something that looks a little weird but then you're free to optimize it what does that mean you're free to simplify it so long as your the assembly you end up with is still isomorphic to the one that the logic tells you you should be using so that's good to know Okay, I'd like to just say a couple of words what happens after this. Namely, we didn't get a topos. Assemblies don't form a topos. What does that mean? That means we don't have, for type theorists, we don't have prop. Prop is not one of the assemblies. The ones we had, the two element assemblies, they're tiny little pieces of prop, but they're not the entire prop. So, in, or to say in terms of uh, topos theory, we don't have a sub-object classifier. Okay. And I will just explain what needs to be done to get a topos. Uh, not from the categorical point of view, because then I would say something like exact completion of something, la la la, and you know, it's some categorical construction, but in terms of conceptual understanding. So the conceptual understanding goes, at least to my mind, goes as follows. When we saw that having an assembly is a very reasonable idea that come that can be motivated directly from programming practice namely that you have a piece of code which realizes an element and you can think of this as saying r realizes the fact that x exists you can think of it as this is the compute this is how the computer understands the existence of x that's one way of understanding what is going on it's a witness of existence of x so this goes this brings us uh, a long way but not all the way to topos to get to the topos you need to make an important conceptual step, which is it's not enough anymore to consider evidence of an element being there in isolation, looking just at the single element at a the, at the time. What you really need to do is you need to start giving evidence of how things are equal. So 
an object in the topos, if we build a realizability topos, would be a set X and now a relation which takes two elements and tells you how they're equal. But it tells you how they're equal using computational evidence. It may now happen. Oh, this has to have conditions which I'm not going to discuss more or less symmetry and transitivity, um, but done again in the realizability logic. So what is now the essential difference here? So this goes back also to something that Dana Scott wrote about. I think maybe he was the first one is you can think of in general, you can think of existence of saying the things exist. Like the current king of France, does the current king of France exist? Yes. But you can also compare things, whether they're equal. And this one is really a special case. This is a special case of equality, namely to say that something exists. One way to understand that something exists is to say that it equals itself. So what we are doing is we are we are passing from the fact that things exist to the to to measuring in what way they're equal. Okay. So this is a topic for another class. It's not not now. We're also running out of time. I just wanted to say a couple of words that there is. So the point is there is a conceptual jump that brings you to the actual realizability topos, which I think is not intuitive to the working programmer in the street. It's, it's a little more mathematical in what's going on. Um, why? Well, because the objects in the topos, which are not assemblies, hardly feature in programming practice. In fact, everything that you will see in programming practice is gonna be a modest assembly. So um, this is, going to some sort of higher abstraction. OK, I'm going to finish here. Thank you. We have a chat. Let's see if the chat won't say anything. There is a. Uh, OK, so there's somebody's hand is up. Chat 16. Oh, my God. <laughs> Okay. Chat, chat, chat. No, it's walkthrough participants. Where's chat? Hmm? Nope. There's the chat. So, but there's a hand up. Whose hand is up? Is it my hand? Yes. Is my hand is up? No. Oh, yes. Lower hand. There you go. Okay. Questions? Uh, so, you mentioned that if we do assume modesty, then in that case, we do get a bonus. No. If we assume modesty, we will get a locally Cartesian closed subcategory of assemblies and not a topos. But without modesty? With, so, okay. So we did not see a topos today, other than in the last three minutes. Hints of a topos. OK, but uh, what's the reason for not including modesty into the definition of assembly? Um, as I said, I want to jolt your minds, especially those of programmers, and say, why not implement everything using 42? You should consider the possibility. It might be a stupid one, but consider it. From a mathematical point of view, the answer would be the category of assemblies has a nicer structure, richer structure than the category of modest assemblies or modest sets. They're quite similar. You can do a lot of things in modest uh, assemblies, but in particular, you don't get NABLA. And that's an important point. So you're kind of limited to just modest sets, right? the ones that are not too big. 
Yes. Uh, can we make an assembly by taking the underlying PCA and taking sort of the diagonal uh, uh, relation? Does this give you some sort of initial uh, object? And, uh, okay, so the question and is, can we take the PCA A and the set. and then the assembly will have as its carrier set, it will have the PCA yeah. and the realizability relation will essentially be a quality. Mm -hmm. Every element of the PCA realizes itself. Okay, what this is saying is that the assemblies, the category of assemblies, can see its own PCA, right? It's one of the objects. It's there. So this is, uh, in fact, important. And this PCA will have certain properties. It will be a projective object. Um, so it will, it will give you the road to the realizability logic talking about its own realizability relation. Um, and in fact, you can look up books um, on realizability where this is uh, it, this is this can be done, and it's important that, uh, uh, for instance, that uh, arithmetic can speak about realizability in the first linear algebra. So, when the realizers are numbers, you can just then say, "Oh, can I speak about? Can I have a relation?" That says this number realizes this fact and, and this is studied. So it's a relevant question. It's a good question. The answer is yes, and people have studied this. I don't know if they've studied it so much for a general PCA. I know definitely for linear realizability, like the number realizability, this is there are theorems that characterize it. Um, but I'm not sure. These abstract characterizations of realizability processes that included the characterization of an object that will be. Ah, yes, yes. And so Alex is pointing out that there are characterizations of realizability that use that object. Yeah, yeah, yeah possibly. I mean, it's a huge topic, so, yeah. Any other questions? One about the quality at the end, so we were defining the topos. Yes. So is the, then the existence is defined when we already fixed a certain equality. Yes. So when you're defining the topos objects, you the, the the extra structure that you're imposing on a set is equality, and then existence is a derived concept, which is being equal to itself. And this was already uh, worked out and advertised. Um, uh, this goes under the name of what logics of partial partial element is that what they call them partial elements something like that there's a paper by dana scott where he sort of laid the groundwork for this and other people worked on it where you say oh what so the question is important is how do you axiomatize how do you set up a mathematical environment where partiality is uh, built in from the start you allow partiality because this is, there's always a little bit of um, uneasiness with this partiality business. For instance, when you have this uh, ratchet division by zero and stuff like that, and you say, oh, how do we handle division by zero? And one way to handle it is to say, let's admit that there can be undefined things, but what happens to logic after that? And so this is also a topic that's studied. One more question. Sure. Uh, is it possible to have also a left adjoint to the forgetful function for assemblies to set? Exercise. <laughs> okay, somebody asked me the last question. I was thinking we could go for burgers because we had pizza last time. Okay. That was the last question. So now we're done. We're also over time. So. Um, Thanks.